Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are, and welcome to the latest edition of Free Thought Hour. Now, before we start, I've got a piece of advice to give you, and it's very simple. It's this. Never have children. Why do I say that? It's because I've been driving my daughter to and from school in a, trapped in a car with her breathing germs, and I've now got her sore throat. See? My advice is very sound. What do you think, Tercia? I absolutely 100% agree. And if you're a woman, stick to that <laughs> advice even more because I've still got the battle scars to show. But at the same time, I love my three to bits. So, <laughs> Well, uh, there, is, there is that always. And I yes. don't take my own advice, as you know. I've got an excess of children. So. Absolutely. So, yes, that, that's the point about advice. You give it. You don't, ex you don't uh, necessarily exactly. expect exactly. the advice yeah. that you give. <laughs> what do you think, Tim? Do you think you should take your own advice? Um, on this subject or in general? <laughs> in general. Because my, my view is that really... I want my advice to come from a greater authority than me. I'd like to think that um, if you limited your advice to mm. that which you follow, then it wouldn't be as useful. Um, ah. I think it's better to reflect on what on the mistakes that we've made in our own lives mm. and uh, yeah. develop mm. our advice for others based upon that. I don't yeah, know. yeah, yeah. Probably so. And and in particular about having children. What? what <laughs> well, I'm I'm, I'm well, saying I've this. Got, I've got two, and I wouldn't dare say anything against them. So, uh... <laughs> or having them. <laughs> so, I'm afraid once one's um, made the jump um, to have them, it is uh, at the same time one of the best and one of the worst experiences. But I would not, not I would have not not had my kids for any money in the world. But um, talking about having children or not, there's what is the philosophical. Um, uh thinking of th these are what is it called um there's a, a growing number of people who actually say that we shouldn't be having children is it um post it's not post humanism it's um it's a philosophical uh, school of thought um uh, in fact propo proposed by a south african philosopher from the university of cape town so uh, that's, you know that's more about that than I do, by the sounds of it. Um, it doesn't um, sound a very um, positive philosophy. Where does it? No, it you? isn't. It isn't positive. But maybe, maybe an anti anti natalism. Anti natalism. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I mean, the, the, mm. You could argue that the human race is bad for the planet, for the rest of life on the planet. We are essentially an infection yep. in the, mm. you know, on, on the biosphere. Um, yeah, yeah. The Gaia theory, that, that uh, the biosphere yeah, yeah. is a living organism. Yeah. Um, and at the moment, the human, be the human race uh, does seem to have taken over and infected it. And uh, well, um, the I think climate change could be Gaia's way of ridding itself of this mm. station yeah yeah so, never so. mind because life is a actual it is actually a fatal condition that i think that i think that's the premise of anti <laughs> difficult position that views birth and procreation of sentient beings including non-human animals as morally wrong antinatalists oh, argue that humans should abstain mm. from pro on the planet it's more the case that to bring another human being into the world or sentient being into the world means that you cause them suffering because to be alive well, we're, we're, losing, we're, we're losing your audio tersia and oh, and yeah. also also you're getting you're getting very nihilistic and i don't like it <laughs> so we've got you we've got tim you're here because of your expertise in pan psychism and i had to find that out what it was called after you last visited us and yeah. you're gonna you're now gonna tell me that you, it's not what you <laughs> it's not what you contend anyway go ahead it is it is um oh, well, pan, okay. pan psychism is a very old um idea um goes back 
uh, probably a couple of thousand years, and I'm forgetting exactly the, the philosophers that uh, promoted it. But it, it's been around for a very long time, um, and a lot of it is, is related to trying to solve um, what, what, what one might call the mind-body mind problem uh, of understanding how, how a material body can create something called a, a mind, which has experience. Um, and the, this, the argument put very simply is that it's very difficult to see how non-conscious matter can give rise to um, a conscious mind, the, the, the human mind. Um, and so uh, the, the, the suggestion is that consciousness exists within matter itself. And mm. somehow it would therefore be easier to see how um, mind within matter can give rise to human consciousness. Um, mm. is, does that make is that making simple sense? Um, I, I suppose if you start with with an absence of mind, and you have various objects. There's there's one object. There's another object. Um, so atoms and particles. If you say they're they're made of matter, there's no mind in them. If you put them together in various combinations, uh, the idea is, um, or the physicalist idea is that uh, eventually that that combination, uh, when shaped in the, such as a, a human brain, um, becomes sentient. It becomes conscious. But we can't explain how that works. Right. The theory is that if if the particles of matter, if, if atoms and, and so on, have a little bit of consciousness within them, then when they are put together, you can explain, or it makes it e an easier problem to solve. Yeah. We have the hard problem of consciousness of how you get consciousness out of not out of matter which is not conscious. Yeah. And the idea goes, the argument goes, not necessarily my argument, but the argument goes that if you start off with a little bit of consciousness within matter itself, within atoms and particles, then it's an easier job of explaining how when when put together in the form of a complex brain, that that brain can be conscious. Um, and it's a problem which has faced, oh, it's, sorry, it is a an idea uh, which, as I said, has been proposed many, many times throughout history. It was very popular in the 19th century. It, went, it was favoured by people like William James, Bertrand Russell, um, at the beginning of the 20th century. But then Russell. Russell, yeah. So one of the most common, there's a chap called uh, Philip Goff, who's very keen on um, what he calls Russellian monism, or, um, which, which is... A particular variation of panpsychism um but essentially it's all about there being a little bit of, of experience conscious experience within matter which then combines somehow to create the human mind but there's a problem in there and it's the problem called the combination problem which is well okay so you've got lots of little bits of consciousness yeah but how do you explain how they all combine together to create the human mind? You yeah, know, I would argue is as difficult a problem as is to explain how non-conscious particles come together to create a human mind. So simply saying panpsychism as an idea, um, I don't think it's, it, it's enough. Um, and so the people that are advocating panpsychism at the moment, uh, as I said, I mentioned Philip Goff, He's, he's definitely of the view that uh, as you go down through, um, you know, you've got a human being, you've got a cell, you've got a molecule, of an atom and a particle, as you get smaller and smaller, there's a little bit of mind within, within all of those things. But it's, it's so much simpler and um, the smaller you go. And that's the same with life. So an, an ant might have a certain amount of consciousness but they have a much smaller amount of consciousness than human beings uh, and of course then when you get down to a particle of matter then you've you've got virtually nothing there but somehow all of those particles when combined create a human mind but but nobody's really solved that problem the combination yeah. so uh, panpsychism as a as a concept itself still remains in the um 
it, it's a nice idea, but, you know, and it yeah. sounds plausible. It doesn't really hang together as a current coherent explanation for mine. Mm -hmm. Was Philip Goff the person that I raised in our um, Twitter chat, Twitter messages? I, sure. I, I sent you a link, didn't I, um, in Twitter messages about this. Uh, <laughs> I don't. Follow, following our last, your last visit to our I show. Have to check. I'm not sure. And uh, he's, he's all over the podcasts at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Been, yeah, it was it was Philip Goff on Within Reason, which is a Cosmic Skeptics channel. Oh, that's right. Yes, mm. yes, I, yes. I didn't get around to watching that, but I, I have seen a lot of Philip Goff, so <laughs> I get I get the kind of ideas that he's promoting. Um, so, so b before we continue, I think it might be useful, John. On, if you could, for the sake of our viewers who are really interested in this um, tough, complex, but and very deep question, I found the conversation that we're, we're losing your audio, Persia. Um, okay, hang, hang on. That's better. When you did that, um, were you How's nearing that? your microphone? Can you say that near to your microphone? Because it seems to be better. Oh, <laughs> wrong again. <laughs> I think she's she's plugged into a different socket. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. No sound nope. at all, no. Well, while she's fiddling with her sound. Not very good. Sorry. What? While you're fiddling with your sound, um, Tim. Yeah. What that seems to propose is little bits of consciousness. I have yeah. problem. I have problems with that. I, I have a problem with that as well. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's making consciousness into a sort of Lego. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's Lego, but there's also the idea that you can have less consciousness or you can be less conscious. Yes. Um, yes. And, and it, it, that, it's easier to, to think about when we talk about other animals. So um, we can just about credit a mouse, let's say, to have consciousness. We, we're certainly confident with that cats and dogs. Mm. Um, well, let's say a mouse. Does a mouse have less consciousness than a human? Would you say? Or is it... Um, is consciousness a one or zero? Are, are you either conscious or you're not? And and the, the the prevailing belief among scientists and philosophers is that well, obviously, it's obvious a mouse isn't as conscious as a human being. Mm -hmm. um, it's somehow less conscious. Now, I would question why is it obvious? You can't see how conscious a mouse is. Um, now, the the argument goes that they're not as sophisticated. They're they're you know, compared to human beings, um, you know, we've invented nuclear bombs and uh, computers and all sorts of clever things, but a, a mouse hasn't done any of that, so it's clearly not as clever. But that yeah. doesn't really translate into consciousness, whether you can actually be conscious of one's own existence living in a world. Yeah. Uh, and I would say that the idea that you, um, uh, you've somehow got less consciousness doesn't really make coherent sense. Um, but the argument kind of goes that um, when we are waking up, uh, we are becoming conscious. So, so as we, as we, sort of first open our eyes, we our eyes are blurry. We're not, we don't see things. We're not thinking as clearly. So we're less conscious. And then, as we wake up, we stand up. We become more conscious. Um, and then, if we're in a very heightened state of alert, where we might have yet more consciousness. And that's the idea that a, a dog or a mouse has less of it than we do. Hmm. But that simply well, doesn't that simply doesn't match with the no. evidence because because a mouse is running around um, like crazy. A fly is reacting as quick, uh, you know, far faster than the, any human being can can uh, can yeah. react. 
So on what basis would we say that a smaller animal is less conscious? If, if anything, it seems to have more consciousness because it's more alert. Tim? Mm. Yep. So, so in, in, my, in my conversation with my 16-year-old son earlier tonight, when I told him about our conversation tonight, I, I said we, it's always useful for me, at least, to go back to the definitions of concepts. And I just thought, let me look up the meaning of the word consciousness. And it's um, the two definitions on my phone are that one, the state of being aware and responsive to one's surroundings, and yeah, two, mm -hmm. a person's awareness or perception of something. Now, if if I apply that definition, then I don't think it would be fair to say that I am more conscious than a mouse, because oh, yeah. a mouse is well, a fly for that matter, is extremely aware and responsive to the surroundings. And last night, my daughter told me that um, she was, so we have a big ridgeback. And when my daughter comes home, this dog sleeps in bed with her because she <laughs> just loves her dog. Yes, um, really. And she said, so it's getting quite cold. And she was pulling the duvet over herself. But the dog is lying right next to her, this massive horse-like ridgeback. And she says he was only only partly covered because she pulled the duvet up to cover her body. And she says this dog, who's by the way named Lucas, he he looked up and he looked at her and he grabbed the edge of the duvet with his <laughs> mouth and he pulled it over himself. So how is that more conscious than a human being? <laughs> In fact, that would be more conscious than a five-day-old baby because a five-day-old baby would neither be aware nor able to yeah. cover themselves when they felt cold yeah. so yeah. The, w what you're raising if and i have to make it very clear that i am still just touching the shores of the whole idea of panpsychism and it even consciousness for that matter. So that's why I'm going back to the basics and just asking myself, what do we mean at the most basic level so that I can enter this discussion with my 16-year-old when we talk about consciousness? And I think that that's what makes these types of conversations valuable. Let me answer that question then, because the, the philosopher's understanding of the word consciousness is subtly different, I think, even from the two you've said. It's, okay. it's closer to the second definition. So it's the it's it's conscious experience. It's the thing we have when we, or it's the thing we gain when we wake up that we didn't have when we were in a dreamless sleep. Mm -hmm. We we have so the experience of the color blue. So it, it it's often talked about as the qualitative um, aspect of uh, of our awareness. So so. Um, the fact that we hear sounds, the fact that we feel pain, the fact that we um, can see colors. Uh, mm -hmm. So more than just awareness, because a robot, you could say, has an awareness because mm -hmm. a robot might have a camera mm -hmm. and it has an image and then it can react to that, that image. It might have been mm -hmm. coded to react in a certain way, mm -hmm. depending upon the you know what it sees in its in in um, the camera or what it hears from from the microphone but we don't really think a robot has any experience of that or to put it even simpler um when you take a picture with a camera you don't imagine the camera actually sees the picture it doesn't have an experience of the picture and it's that experience that we mean when we talk about consciousness well, that's when philosophers talk about consciousness um, and I often use the, the term conscious experience just to emphasize that when we're talking about consciousness, it's the, ex, it's the experiential bit. Right. Well, now, can I come in here? Because I've, I've got a number of threads I want to pursue in this conversation. But let's, let's stick to that one that you've just raised about um, the experience of consciousness. It, the awakening if you like well the feeling the feeling the sensations that you have when you are awake so it's feeling true. pain so when you sit on a cushion does the yeah. cushion feel your weight does it feel pain when no. you sit on it now i don't think it does 
No, I don't think it does either. Of course, it depends on the weight of the person sitting. Depends on the weight of the person. <laughs> um, and I don't believe a camera actually sees the, no, the no. It doesn't have an experience of the image, whereas I believe a human being does. And the reason I right. believe it is because I have it. And because yes. I'm very similar in some ways to yeah. you, then I believe you have that as well. Yes. yes. The question this then becomes, does a mouse have the same sort of experience? Yes. This is the or theory of mind. Right. Does it have less of that experience? Mm. Or does a cell um, have a, you know, an amoeba? Does exactly. an amoeba have an experience? And, and so, so, we generally say no. Scientists um, and neuroscientists would say that, no, no, you, to have an experience, a consciousness is something that's created in the, in the brain as a result yeah. of all of these neurons that are talking to each other. So a single amoeba couldn't possibly have any conscious experience inside it now the panpsychic right. would disagree and say no no the, the amoeba does have a little bit of uh conscious experience just as our neurons have conscious experience because uh, there are cells that, that that can respond to stimulus is that right well that's right and that would be my argument this is where i'm trying to distinguish a little bit between what a panpsychist argues and what i'm arguing so i'm arguing that an amoeba like a mouse, like a dog, like a human being, is as conscious as any other living thing. Okay? Because really? for the reason you said, it, it responds, but it does more than responds. It acts of its own volition. It decides, an amoeba decides it's going to reach out and grab something. And so it's so behaving as, in, a, in a, an intentional way. As conscious. That yeah. is a contentious statement. Because... Whereas previously you you had illustrated a sort of progression from yeah. um, let's go backwards. Let's start with a sophisticated animal like us, and yeah. then go down through the mouse, through the ant, through to the amoeba. Yeah. Uh, and and so there is no as conscious because there's degrees. It's a gradation. Well, that's and, what we were debating a second ago. So why do you think there are degrees of consciousness? Well, because I, I thought that's what you were saying, because you did you said that a, an amoeba is less aware, less able, less capable than us. Well, what I'm saying is that that's the general scientific point of view. Yeah. And it's, it's the general point of view, whether you're, um, e even amongst the panpsychists, you see. Yeah. Um, so the panpsychists will say the same. Well, clearly an amoeba isn't as complex as a human being, and and mm. if complexity is somehow related to our conscious, sorry, if if our consciousness is somehow related to the complexity yes. of processing, then an amoeba, it to the extent that it has any experience at all, it must be a lot simpler. Yes. So that's what everybody else is 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 taking as given. But I but question. Saying, I you're, question. You are saying an amoeba is every bit as conscious as we are. Well, it's not obviously every bit as conscious, but I would argue that um, consciousness is, is a, uh, you've either got it or you haven't. Um, you certainly don't see. Oh, any that, so that's quite a unique view because. Um, we've, uh, and I, I would just like to mention this for the sake of our viewers, present, past and future, if we're talking about um, consciousness, I don't, don't know where that fits in. But um, there's a very interesting conversation on the Sheldrake Vernon Dialogues. That was, I was what I was referring to. It's a podcast that was um, broadcast on the 22nd of February, 2021. The Sheldrake Vernon Dialogues on Panpsychism. So what, what I find interesting is that what, what, when they they basically talk about it as sort of an historical overview almost, and they emphasize that there's this idea of degrees of consciousness. So what, am I understanding you correctly that you're saying there's not really degrees, but it's either there or it's not there? In my view. In, in your view. In my view. view it's you're either conscious or you're not you, you you've got okay. that waking you've got that time when you're falling asleep so that's, that's not but but when you're sort of drowsy and you could argue that that's uh, an intermediate state but there's no evidence that um you know mice or scorpions when they're when they're 
two scorpions are, are fighting each other you, there's no art there's no evidence that they are drowsy if anything it's the very opposite they're they're moving very quickly and they're they're you know in a state of high alert um so so, so the whole concept or, or the or what i what i'm questioning is whether there's any empirical evidence whatsoever that a smaller creature has less consciousness than a human and, and it's not related uh, well, to whatever they are. It's just, are they aware? Do they have experience of their own existence? Right. Okay. So I'm, I'm a little bit confused now because it seems that when you were talking about a progression of consciousness yeah. or consciousness emerging with complexity going through to increasing sophistication, and there's lots of evidence for that being the case with other characteristics. Let's not... Let's not yeah. focus on consciousness, but let's focus on other processes which have been becoming increasingly complex throughout the evolution of uh, the, the biological diversity. Mm -hmm. but, but, but it seems to me that were you then arguing like devil's advocate and saying this is what the other people think, because you actually think that consciousness is a switch it's either that's right. on or off that's right so i i'm because you asked me at the outset about panpsychism tell me about panpsychism i'm trying to represent what everybody what all the panpsychists would say mm. they they generally they accept the um assumption and I'll, I'll call it an assumption that all scientists are making at the moment um and probably have done for many years that there are degrees of consciousness and if you're a smaller animal that that you have um less of it one of the arguments as i said is, is the, the 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 issue of complexity that we we are we must be because we're much larger than a mouse or than an ant uh, we must our brains must be more complex than that of an ant okay i have three questions tim so um firstly you use the word larger so is a whale or an elephant more conscious than a human being because they, their brains are larger that's my that's that's the are first thing I'm asking, or are you asking i'm you asking know, you your opinion i don't think anything i don't think degrees of consciousness exist okay it, it doesn't I think, exist so, so i think all all living things um or all animals at the very least uh, oh, they're conscious. Existence, and that's what consciousness is. They okay. all feel pain. Right. They're all right. capable of suffering. So what right. are the implications of this in our daily lives? That's what I'd like to talk about. Um, gosh. Well, it would mean that all the things that we eat... Uh, I mean, we already understand that, and, and have done for a while that uh, the sort of animals that we eat uh, feel pain. They have to cope the capacity to suffer and that's why a lot of people are vegetarian um well before we before we get into the <laughs> pros and cons of vegetarianism or yeah, veganism do you have any evidence i mean you, you are the one who say who claims against the mainstream view yeah with the mainstream view is and, and listen would you contest the the proposition that complexity has increased over the uh, geological time scale and and in all respects you know i mean we've become uh, more capable of locomotion we've become more more adaptable to diet you know we we've, we've become a lot of different capabilities have exhibited yeah. throughout you know, um, deep time. So why do you yeah. claim that consciousness is an exception to that general rule? I don't think it is a general rule. I think um, living things adapt themselves to the environment that they're in. And that applies whether you're whatever size the living thing happens to be i think human human beings have done remarkably well over uh, what is still relatively speaking a very short space of time and it, and you know time will tell whether we will can actually ex sustain our own existence 
um, or, or whether that explosion, that technological explosion, will actually um, be our demise. Um, well, but but my point is that that there no, I think there's no real evidence that that we're more complex and more capable. The animals of our size. Let's set humans to one side. There's no real evidence that we are more capable. That animals are more capable um, if they are larger compared to being smaller. And I think what I would cite, uh, I, I mean, it, it's a reasonable assumption, and it's assumption that kind of everybody makes, um, you know, of, of whatever persuasion one happens to be. You, everyone would assume, as soon as we understood that we're made of cells and that microorganisms, which are single-celled creatures, are, sw are swimming around, it, you know, in the in the the oceans and the, and the lakes. Um, and they're absolutely tiny. You just naturally assume these are the simplest creatures around and they they couldn't do anything remotely like the sort of things that, um, you know, dogs, cats, cows and and uh, well, all other animals do. But sure. But... I mentioned Brian J. Ford. Um, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, yeah yes. Suggested was... him. Yeah. Um, it was great to see he arrived <laughs> in the end. Um, <laughs> Sadly, you didn't. You, hopefully, if you if you get him back on, you'll be able to talk yeah. a little bit more about his research because oh. he's produced some remarkable videos um, oh. of single-celled creatures. And one of his bugbears yeah. is that um, too many, cer certainly too many people in the media, but also scientists themselves, play down the capabilities of a single cell. Well, okay, when you yeah. look at a cell, you can see there are quite remarkable behaviors they they build uh, there are amoebas called a testate amoeba that can build its own home and it doesn't mm. just um what's the word uh, uh extract so, uh so, not extract it doesn't just create the shell by by the minerals coming out of its skin it actually finds um pieces of sand um yes. or tiny fragments from from, yeah. the, uh, from from wherever it finds it, and it constructs the shell from these pieces, yeah. and it creates it in a particular shape. So it has a little lip at, at yes. the end. It has an opening, um, and it, it's it, what Brian does. He, he compares that to um, say a caddis fly. That the way they, yeah, um, yeah. you know, much well, more comp much what we think of as a much more complex um, mm -hmm. organism um, animal that that creates its home. And it sure. says that it's just remarkable to see that a single cell can behave okay. in, in such an apparently intelligent way. Um, well, and that includes things like it, it would put a piece of um, shell or, or uh, um, onto, you know, into place um, to make it to, to make that home, to make to make that vase, if you like, around it. And it's, it notices that it's the, the wrong way around, so it flips it over. And he's saying that this these sort of behaviors you just don't expect to see and this is this is the sort of evidence i'd be pointing to um you would expect if if that tale of um complexity is one that reduces as you get further down that hierarchy of life um including in such so that a cell is is a lot simpler than than a, a large animal you simply wouldn't expect to see that sort of behavior and yes well, we do well, <laughs> many, many a man has been foisted on the hopes of his expectations, I'm afraid. We, can, they, we have no right to expect our expectations to come true. And, and no, no one expect to see simplicity at that level. And the well, point is, we don't Hang on, see, hang, on don't hang on, hang on, yeah. because what you're talking about there, nobody would contest the contention that cells are complex they are a factory and th there's a school of thought that suggests that they have uh, they are actually a symbiotic factory they've absorbed bacteria that turned into mitochondria there's mm. ribosomes which were another separate organism at one time and so on and so forth and of course the earlier cells didn't have a nucleus in the sense of one with a membrane and so on but what you're talking about there and what brian Jay Ford was doing with his investigations was looking at the extant pantheon 
of creatures. Mm. And, and those cells have been in existence, possibly, for three and a half billion years. So they've had plenty of an opportunity to, involve, to evolve absolutely mm. sophisticated behaviors, even though they're only cells. However, if you wind the clock back, look at the geological time scale, you'll find that they, the, there is definitely a progression. You know that the, early, the oldest fossils that we've got are of, um, what are they called? They're um, some sort of very primitive single-celled algal-type creature that forms um, rock mounds in the, their okay. survivors. Are, yeah, their survivors are still in hot pools in Australia. But, and, and at that time, if you go to, when was this? It was um, pre, pre-Cambrian. It was the Ediacaran era. And, and you find that there's no mammals, fish, you know, no birds, no dinosaurs. Nothing. John, stromatolites. What you're thinking Thank of are stro- stromatolites. Thank you. Wonderful. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> so, so looking back, although I would argue like you that there's never been any intention to, to evolve greater complexity or sophistication, that's what has actually happened. And so, so what you're saying? I would still, I would still dispute it, but, but, um, well, what you, what, what we haven't touched, on, what we haven't touched on is the reasons why I'm suggesting this. Can I, can I just finish my point and then I'll get oh, to you? Sorry, yeah. 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 So what, what you're saying is don't look at all of the obvious evidence that there has been a, com- a progression of increasing complexity over 3.5 billion years. Take for granted my contention that consciousness was just switched on once, possibly. This was just switched on. Um, sorry, I, I'm trying to relate the two. It's not a gradation. It's not a progression. Oh, it's, it's not just... a gradation. Um, well, first of all, I would still dispute the idea that there is that we can see greater complexity. We can see greater size, and with size, we can see there's more going on, and so it appears to be much more complex. Um, but uh, I would argue that a single cell is as complex as a human being or and, and vice versa um now that seems intuitively obvious it seems obviously wrong that a single cell could be as complex as a human being but there is a reason why i'm saying this um and that is uh if we jump back to that question of panpsychism and how you how you combine all of these bits of um small bits of consciousness is the idea into creating a human brain a human mind it doesn't work in my view that simply doesn't work um but you you could let me um (laughs) i was about to go off on a on a wonderful tangent there maybe i should bring it back um feel free (laughs) i'll 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 come back to normality um (laughs) there are many problems that we have that science is unable to explain. One of those is how life works. Um, now you'll say, well, no, we, 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 know, we know that because we know um, we've got biology to explain how, you know, how lots of different processes work. Um, but there's something very simple about how life works. Um, and that's that I, I can act um, in order to get something. Now, a non-living thing here so take that stapler, it doesn't act, it just sits there not doing anything. So what is it about an organism that enables it to act? Um, now, interestingly, organisms like human beings are made of cells. Um, if all my cells were to die, then I would not be able to live. I would not be able to live, I, I could not act. Okay, if my, and it's because my cells are acting that I am able to act, okay? So it's the, it's the fact that my cells are alive that allowed me to, to be alive. But how does a cell, how is a cell able to be alive? Now you ask a scientist and they'll say it's because it's, it's a machine. Okay, it's a biochemical machine. 
Um, and it's a machine like any machine that human beings would create. They're made of parts and those parts follow laws of nature. And it's the complexity of the design that allows this machine to work. Now that, in, in my view, in fact, it's more than my view, it is just a fact that is wrong because every machine that a human being has created, including this one, is made of parts which, yeah, if you were to take this apart, it, every single part there um, behaves entirely predictably. And it, it follows- Maybe in your stapler, not in mine. I've never had a stapler that behaved predictably. <laughs> they always behave very unpredictably. Bad example, Tim. Well, <laughs> take, take any machine, if you take it apart all the parts behave in line with laws of nature yeah and it's the fact that they follow some law of law of physics or law of chemistry that makes them predictable okay um and it's the fact that they're predictable that we can design a machine and know in advance what it's going to do and that's how the process of design kind of works um living things are not like that you cannot decompose a living thing into a finite number of pre predictable parts because living things are made of organs those organs and, and systems are made of cells those cells are made of organelles those organelles are made of large complex organic molecules those are made of smaller organic molecules those are made of atoms those are made of particles and so on every single one of those entities in what i call the hierarchy of life is not predictable there are no laws of nature and I'll, I'll repeat this there are no laws of nature that allow us to predict the behavior of any of those entities and that includes particles atoms and molecules the very things that make up all matter now how is that predictable how are the parts in that machine predictable well they're predictable because every part there is an is a collection of of a large number of particles or atoms or molecules. And because they're a large number, um, the individual behaviors all cancel each other out. And it's the average behavior that becomes the behavior of, of the part. And it's the average behavior of the, of, of the atoms within each part then that we are describing with laws of nature. But the law of nature cannot, so, so, a law of physics, whether it's Newton's laws or laws of chemistry and so on, will never tell us how a single atom or molecule will behave. It only tells us how this larger number behaves. Okay. Right. So all of those things are unpredictable. All of those entities that, that a an organism would be decomposed into, they're unpredictable. So a living, a, sorry, a machine is a collect a finite it, sorry it's a collection of a finite number of predictable parts a living organism is not you cannot decompose a living organism into a finite number of predictable parts that's the key difference um, and for this reason then the biochemical explanation for the behavior of a cell does not work because a cell is not right. a machine so we need a better explanation I've got a couple of responses to that. Um, first of all, you, you've just undermined medicine. Yeah. Go on, in what way? <laughs> because if we can't predict how complex organisms will behave because they are so distant from the cell, which might be predictable in it, as a tiny unit, mm -hmm. then no no treatment can be prescribed no a, a treatment um generally works if a treatment's working at the cellular cellular level it would um say a chemical that, that you're given um and it works within the cells then you're talking about a large number of cells so a sing as, as any individual cell may react differently okay so we um, but it's the fact that they all, on average, react in a certain way to that chemical. But, but, but does, to... does the... So, let me just... So, you're saying that the, each individual cell is conscious. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> We're jumping about a bit here. Um, I want to ask, 
because that, because if if it if it's so if you're saying that each individual cell is conscious, but the consciousness of each individual cell doesn't really have an impact because what matters if we think about medicine, for example. So if I'm if yeah. I have a, um, a, a reflux, then there's there's a physiological cause that's caused by my my physical cells reacting to something or responding in a certain way and and there's a a, a predictable uh, treatment for that based on the response of the the aggregate of average cells and therefore yeah. it's it's sort of almost irrelevant how each individual cell is going to respond because mm. the, the, how each individual cell responds when i take the antacid has no effect on on my experience of having reflux or not having reflux. That's right. So they, th therefore, one could then reason that it doesn't matter um, if each individual cell is conscious. And and then, but then that leads me to ask, so, but the, then there's, if, if you're saying that each individual cell is conscious, but we've acknowledged that the consciousness of each individual cell does not really have a res uh, an effect on the consciousness of the organism as a whole. Then why does that consciousness matter? It doesn't really. It's not relevant. I think, and then, I think consciousness then, confuses this this matter. If you don't mind me saying so, it's what we're talking about at the moment. We, in terms of laws of uh, laws of physics, laws of chemistry and biology relating to an individual versus an aggregate. Um, it's not really the question of consciousness. Um, that's that's kind of a separate issue, I think. Um, I mean, you could say that um, it, it was certainly went went on about medicine. Um, but let's say let's let's say let's talk about chemistry and and the laws of chemistry that say a certain reaction works in a certain way. Um, what that is actually doing is describing how a group of molecules on average will behave and in fact we know that's the case that's quite explicitly accepted by chemists as being the case because any reaction has a sort of an, an equilibrium point where some of the 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 the, the reaction goes what you know so, so much of it goes one way but it can also come back the other way so there can be an equilibrium where uh, it, it appears that the reaction that the chemicals are no longer reacting but actually they are. Some are going one way, some are going the other way. But overall, um, nothing is actually happening, if you like. So the, the, the law is describing the aggregate, even though the individual um, could be behaving quite differently. Okay. Well, well, yes, but, but the, 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 the whole idea of aggregation is to get a consensus of all, all the little differences. And of course, yeah. this, is, this is the principle we talk behind meteorology isn't it and it works very well i mean they don't call it prediction they call it forecasting and they divide up the atmosphere into cells and calculate their trajectory and how they're likely to behave and what that might mean in terms of local weather so i i don't see how that... that's, that's a subtly different thing um I, I'm not sure. <laughs> I, let me, let me, yeah, th that will confuse matters because I'm not talking about chaos. I'm not talking about difficulty of predicting weather systems. What I'm talking about, hey, here's an example. Human beings, we can define the law of traffic flow in terms of um, which people have done, you know, so they can model the, the way traffic is flowing on, on, you know, on a motorway, what happens yeah. in a traffic jam and, and, and so on. And, and to take a very simple example, um, at a given junction, you might have a law that says that 30% of cars go to the left, 50% go on, go straight on, and 20% go to the right. And you could um, have any experiment on any particular day that measures, so let's take, a, you know, take 500 cars that go through that junction, and sure enough, 30% go to the left, 50% go on, and 20% go to the right. And you could say, ah, this law is... You know, I've validated this law, I've tested it, and, mm -hmm. and this law works. Now, it's not that law that is determining how any one car behaves, though. So any one car, you know, it, it could go to the... It, that law will not tell you how any single car will behave. 
Okay. No, no. Well, the law is really... not operating at the level of the car. No. Take any single car, you're turning left. You have no reason to go straight or no reason to go right. You're turning left because that's the way you have to be going. So the law is neither, uh, it neither helps us to predict the behavior of a single car, nor can you in any way say that that law is determining the behavior of the cars. It absolutely isn't. It's, it's a well, descriptive law after the fact that yes. looks at the aggregate. And what I'm saying is that all of our laws of physics, laws of chemistry and so on, they are exactly like that. So this this belief that we all have, do you remember last time I was talking about fundamental scientific beliefs that we have that may or may, not, may, or may not be true. Oh. One of these is that um, all, all matter, is, the behavior of matter is determined by laws. And I'm saying, well, that's just not true. But, and it's well, very similar to the traffic situation. Uh, yeah. and we can see that because whenever we look at any single law, whether we're talking about the conservation laws, you know, conservation of momentum and energy, when we're talking about chemistry, um, if we're talking uh, about thermodynamics, um, or the laws of quantum mechanics, they all relate to large numbers of entities, particles, atoms, yeah. and molecules. They can't, yeah. they don't allow you to predict the behavior of any of any single one so the behavior of each entity is not determined by the law okay no now tertia you ask asking about consciousness yes my when you get to the end of that of the whole whole chain of reasoning you eventually get to saying that these entities are complex as complex as a human being and the reason for that is that there are um that chain of um, organism, um, organ, cell, molecules, simple molecule, atom, particle, that goes on forever. Um, and it's because it goes on forever that means all of these entities are actually far more complex than we imagine them to be. So and right. this is why I'm saying this cell is just as complex as, as a human being. And indeed, a, a particle of matter is as complex as a human being. Now, my, my, my question is, okay, let's i'm fine to accept that but now i want I to know <laughs> well, i want no, to get no. to the i want to get to the next point let me pull that apart first okay yeah, yeah. Okay, okay right pull it apart i really wish we didn't call these scientific uh descriptions laws, laws because yeah. language we're using the wrong words that has a legal connotation, which specifies uh, rules that should be followed, and if they're not, if they're disobeyed, sanctions will be applied. It's nothing to. It's nothing like that. The laws of physics are observations of how things have been seen to behave. There's no yeah. constraint. They don't have to follow those laws. That's. They are not laws in the sense of constraining. It's That's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. But physicists do make an assumption that um, if you set aside quantum mechanics, because everyone, everyone accepts quantum mechanics is this weird sort of um, physics where you can it deals in, in probabilities and so, so on, and you can't predict the actual behavior of a single particle. We all sort of recognize that. But we take it for granted somehow that all the other laws that we have do um just let's say describe the behavior of a single atom or molecule and so on that that um that these entities do follow the laws for whatever reason they follow them well 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 well, well. but no. what i'm no, saying no, no. is that they don't they only follow the law in aggregate and this is, well, yes. this is the bit that we're but, missing but but those those laws so-called laws weren't always followed most of them apply to matter and according to the current understanding of the cosmology there wasn't always matter so what did the laws apply to then what did the laws apply to then yes well, there was no matter there was no matter there was no matter to have strong and weak nuclear forces no matter to, to interact in a way that we call gravity, no matter to possess any electrical or magnetic properties. So 
the laws did not apply pre-matter. I would agree with that. So they are not laws in the sense of anything has to obey them. What they are I, I agree. Is, is just descriptions of how we've seen since, you know, the origin of the universe, things yeah. appear to behave. I, I see that's really absolutely right. That's absolutely right. That doesn't there's, no, there's no compulsion that's... about it. And in the so future... I'm not, they I'm not, not arguing anything different to that, John. They may not behave like that in the future as we approach, you know, heat death. No, but we take it for given, we, we kind of take it for granted that they follow those laws, whether they're compelled to follow them. We, we always take it for dangerous. Always Sorry? dangerous to take things to, for granted. No, but anyway, the, the key point, the reason we were talking about that was that um, these entities are unpredictable. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. And we, and they differ from from any part of a machine. I keep picking this up. Any part, um, these things aren't unpredictable. We can predict exactly how those will behave. So any machine, um, you know, is made of a finite number of predictable parts. Whereas a living thing, any organism, including human beings, including cells, they are not. So the machine um, explanation for the behavior of a living thing, of an animal or of a cell, simply doesn't work. It simply doesn't work. In fact, it's a large number of, of molecules, so it, it ought to follow some law, but it doesn't. It, it's unpredictable. But the weird thing is that the unpredictable entities in the world, in, in the universe, are precisely the entities within that hierarchy of life. So it starts with particles and atoms and molecules, um, any other collection of molecules is then very predictable. But if you create a complex organic molecule, that is unpredictable. If you combine those complex organic molecules into an organelle like a mitochondrion, that is unpredictable. If you combine those organelles into a cell, that is unpredictable, and so on. So the we talked about this uh, last time, the unpredictability of human beings and the fact that we... You, you can't predict our behavior using laws, using any kind of laws of physics, is nothing to do with our supposed complexity because that inability to predict our behavior applies all the way down that chain without a break, all the way down to particles of matter. So there's something in that chain that they're all, they all have in common. Particles, atoms, molecules, complex organic molecules, all the way up to human beings, something they all have in common have in common and what i'm suggesting they have in common is that they are alive okay and you're and, calling that consciousness and happens to be conscious as well when they act they are acting with consciousness so, so they, they are, with, with, with um intention with purpose so, so the so, clump of so, so john uh, the clump of cells that gets to that that goes together to form a cancerous tumor they acted yeah. with intent Oh, absolutely. Yeah. T cancer is, are, the, are the criminal um, entities with, within an organism. They, they've decided, they've, they've given up on the, the laws of the state, if you like. Forget the word laws. But they're, they're not going to obey by, you know, they're not going to play by anybody else's rules anymore. They're going to create their own little criminal, organized criminal gang within, um, within <laughs> society. And they're going to go off on the road. And then kill and the host so that happens with cancer. So are my cells sort of like parasites? And the, the, the good ones are good symbi in sim because if they're conscious, then the cells in my body are analogous and the bad ones are like like a criminal syndicate taking over the city and destroying oh, the city. You've in got a police force. And, and your white blood <laughs> cells, the, the the white blood cells, your T cells, um, yeah. they're the police force. Yes. They um, they get trained. But to they can also go bad. I mean that Oh, my yes. goodness. But just to reiterate one point that we may have lost in all of this. Um, the, re the biochemical explanation for a living thing doesn't work, I'm su suggesting. What does work is the explanation that I, as a human being, am a community of living cells. And it's the fact that the, my cells are alive that enables me to be alive. If my cells were to die, I would die. So... I live because I'm a community of living cells. 
How do the cells live? I'm saying it's because a cell is a community of living things. So every cell is a community yes. of living organelles, okay. every organelle is a community of living <laughs> molecules, and so on and so on. And it's the oh. so on and so on that yes. means that, that chain never stops because that chain, if that chain of explanation came to a stop, you wouldn't be able to explain how the entities at the bottom were behaving. Right. So in this theory of universal life that I've devised, that chain of living things being communities of living things continues forever and ever and ever. An infinite so regression. What I suggest we do, my suggestion is yeah. that, uh, Tim, are you familiar with the, the animation movie based on Dr. Seuss's book, um, Horton Hears a Who? I don't remember that particular one. Okay, well, I, let's, let's make a pact and we'll all go and watch Horton Hears a Who and we'll we'll have a discussion on that because me, every every time we speak i think of that film and if you watch it and you look then the, the next time we have a discussion at my level and we do a movie review in view of your book life the universe and consciousness um using horton here's a who as um an analogy so that i can understand but, but the one thing that that still bugs me is yeah. um that what are the implications of this so so if if that does that mean that that as a my my consciousness as a whole is built up of the consciousness of all the cells within me yeah. and is there's no is there any higher but, this, but, is what panpsych, this is where panpsychists go wrong okay the panpsychists have a face with something called the combination problem and it's the problem of um, how do you explain how all of these little bits of consciousness in our brain cells combine to create a human consciousness? Because there's something about human consciousness, in fact, any one presumes any consciousness, it, it's this unity of consciousness. Mm. You know, we do have different experiences, spells, sights, um, lots of sights at the same time, but they're all brought together into a unified consciousness. Now, how does yeah. that work? And, the, and there are yeah. philosophers that will write very complex papers on how they imagine, you know, panpsychist philosophers will write complex papers on how they imagine that can happen. Um, but really, we know that um, if you take, it was a chap called William James, philosopher from the end of the 19th century, great bloke. Um, he talked about, uh, so he was a panpsychist and he explained this as saying, if, if you take 10 people in a row and you give them a word in, in a sentence, say a sentence of 10 words, and you, you tell each one a word, and you get them to think intently of their word, he said, nowhere will there be an experience of the whole sentence. Okay, because each oh. conscious experience in lots of different heads does not combine together. It just doesn't. So the panpsychist explanation does not work. My explanation is quite a different one, and it is quite a disturbing one. Ooh. Well, I'm going to call this to an end i'm afraid I, because... I thought you might do because <laughs> <laughs> one hour he's a Which he's a I demon he's a time. demon when it comes it's to like, time we, this is my like rule a... i'm sorry <laughs> this is my rule it's a law <laughs> it's a law <laughs> Bye. Be, before, before we even get into because you've just you spun off into directions there which i would love to pick up on for example <laughs> in your infinite regression of consciousness yeah at what point does free will get inserted all the way all the way up free will uh, is a uh, natural feature of consciousness wow well, there's there's another thing and um and, there is and, no you see you see there are no deterministic laws for the reason i said before so we have no reason to doubt our own free will. This this problem of free will and determinism is 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 based on this false belief we have that laws of physics determine the movement of matter. And as we've just been explaining, laws of physics cannot determine the motion yeah. of matter because yeah. the individual particles and atoms and molecules do not follow the laws of physics. They do their own thing. Yeah. Yeah, the laws and of physics. We all have free, there's no reason to doubt free will. We can all relax and just say, you know, it's yeah. okay. I do get to make choices after all. Like oh, evolution. No. 
Like evolution, the laws of physics act on populations, not individuals. So, and you mentioned, you mentioned the combination problem, yeah. and that borders on the the composition fallacy. I don't know where this could go. <laughs> but we got to go. Feel like we've been all over the place a little bit. So, uh... yeah. we got to. We got to have another go. Years who? I don't Forty know. Years I, I don't know whether in our in our communications, Tim, whether yeah. I introduced you to the concept of blind sight. I I've got an article. I can't find it now. Yeah, that's an interesting one. Which suggests that, yeah. that that consciousness is the ability to play a movie inside our heads, which is a reconstruction of all the signals coming in. The yeah. stimuli from the uh, the, the external world, yeah. and blindsight is an ins it gives an insight into that. And I'll, when I found this article, I'll send it to you. you you'll well, find I, it bring. Yeah, no, the, just a, an interesting reflection on that. Um, there are neuroscientists, um, a chap called Christoph Koch. He's is an excellent chap. He's written some very good popular eyes, uh, popular books on neuroscience. Um, and he, he talks, and I mean, it's, it's generally accepted amongst, amongst neuroscientists. The amount of processing in the brain um, related to consciousness is less than 1%. And mm -hmm. the more neuroscientists examine the brain, examine the, try and develop, try and identify the neural correlates of consciousness, the mm -hmm. lower that number becomes. Mm -hmm. And so it begs the question, well, what else, you know, what, why, is there, why is there all this other processing in the brain? What mm -hmm. is that doing? Um, mm -hmm. And um, if you were to believe my theory, well, that is conscious as well, but mm. it's not necessarily your consciousness. So there are other conscious, potentially other consciousnesses within your own brain. Which you're not aware of. In my subconscious, wow. It could be your subconscious, that's right. Yeah. that's right. So you must, I'd like to invite you to come to Changing Minds in Changing Times, which is an event I'm staging in London on the 4th of June, but in Notting Hill, and it's from 4.30 to 9.30, and in attendance will be a neuroscientist. All right. Professor, okay. Professor Sophie Scott. Oh, I who, love Sophie Scott. Yes, yeah, yeah. she's great. Yeah, come she's along, great. June the 4th. Get a ticket now she's because they're almost, yeah. so, so they're almost all gone. That they, if you're not quick, you'll, you'll miss the, the chance because the tickets are almost sold out. Right. Okay. I'll I'll send you the Eventbrite link. Well, you can just go to Eventbrite, put "Changing Minds in Changing Times," and that, that that's it. Okay. Tim, you've been wonderful. <laughs> Thank, as Thank always. you very much. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure it was quite as coherent as as the last time, but uh, <laughs> I hope it made it sense. Fun. I hope some it of it made sense. It doesn't make sense, but it's conscious. I know that. <laughs> well, I, I used I used to have a conscious mind, but now it's blown. Mine too, absolutely. <laughs> That's what I try to do. <laughs> Success. Thank nice you. to see you. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. <laughs>